Catherine is the author of eight books on topics ranging from urban, urban poverty to middle-class economic insecurity to school violence. Dr. Newman is the senior author in 2004 of Rampage, The Social Roots of School Shootings, which grew out of a National Academy of Science study commissioned by Congress. Her most recent book, in collaboration with Victor Chen, is Missing Class, an analysis of the condition of the near poor in American society. So it's with great pleasure I have to introduce uh, Catherine Newman to you. The short film you just saw was created by 17-year-old Jeffrey Wise, a junior at Red Lake High School in rural Minnesota, not long before he gunned down five students, an English teacher, a security guard at the school, his own grandparents, and finally turned the gun on himself. Wise posted this film to a website viewed by thousands of animation fans around the country and sent long messages to a neo-Nazi website in which he called for racial purity expressed admiration for Hitler and called himself the Angel of Death. The Red Lake community, a remote reservation that's home to the Ojibwa tribe, is 250 miles north of Minneapolis. 90% of the students in the school are officially poor or near poor. It has no history of violence, though it is plagued with very high rates of alcoholism, unemployment, and its students drop out of school at an alarming rate. Jeffrey himself led a very troubled life, his mother was an alcoholic who was committed to a convalescent home after a horrific car accident that left her brain damaged. His father committed suicide when he was 13. He grew up in fairly cosmopolitan surroundings, actually, in Minneapolis, but as a consequence of all these family troubles, moved in with his grandparents on the reservation, where he was regarded as an outsider, as most people who move back and forth between the reservation world and the big city are seen. This profile led reporters to characterize the shooting at Red Lake High School as the spontaneous, deranged response of a loner to personal tragedy. They emphasized the poverty of his surroundings and unleashed a torrent of concerns about life in the Indian nation. We will probably never know the exact truth of the Red Lake tragedy. As a sovereign nation, the Ojibwa tribe is within rights to close its borders and prevent investigative journalists from very, learning very much at all. But as the details began to leak out, it became clear, at least to me, that this tragedy had very little to do with Jeffrey's Indian heritage. And while the tragic facts of his biography are psychologically relevant, he was neither a loner nor a loser. His acts were not spontaneous, but planned way long in advance. And more than a dozen kids on the reservation knew what he had in mind. They just didn't come forward to their everlasting dismay after the fact. He broadcast his murderous impulses for everyone to see. Indeed, hundreds of people saw the film that you just saw. But no one knew how to fit the pieces of his broadcast together. And those who did have an inkling didn't warn anyone who could have intervened. Jeffrey Weiss fits the pattern that I hope to explore with you this afternoon, a pattern that became clear to me and my research team through two years of field work on school shootings. Unfortunately, I suppose for this audience, our work was focused entirely on high schools, although at the end of this lecture, I'm going to reflect a little bit on what I've learned in recent months about shootings that have taken place, rampage shootings uh, on college campuses. But for the high school students, this is a pattern in which intelligent, intellectual boys in very isolated communities come to see themselves as rejects and seek to reverse that negative reputation 
becoming notorious rather than marginal. It's a pattern more cl clearly revealed through sociological understandings of small town life, the pressures of gender policing, and the underbelly of what we call social capital. The origins of this project, as Richard mentioned, lay in the renewal in 1999 of the Missing, Exploited, and Runaway Children's Act by Congress, which mandated this study of qualitative study of shootings in communities around the country. The National Academy of Sciences received this project and called me and a few other people who were known for doing ethnographic work in the United States. And since I had never done any field work in the South or focused on crime, uh, that made me the perfect expert for this project. I had no clue. Um, but these, like many others, I'm, I'm, I'm sure including everyone in this room, these terrible events did pique my interest and my concern as a mother of teenagers in high school at the time. And I too wanted to learn more about why these things were happening. One of the first tasks that my research team faced was delimiting the nature of the phenomenon we were trying to explore. There is an existing database, some of you may be familiar with it, compiled by the Centers for Disease Control that takes one cut at these issues. They include all homicides committed on or near school property or involving students and personnel on their way to and way home from school. This means that instances of gang violence, drive-by shootings, and so forth are all recorded in that database. And that was a wider definition than the one Congress was asking us to explore. The kinds of shootings that Congress was interested in had a particular set of characteristics that set them apart from personal disputes that happened to spill over onto school property, for example. So we tried to narrow the definition of what con to what Congress had in mind and to identify then the characteristics of rampage shootings in schools. And here are some of their marked features. They must have multiple victims. They must occur on school property. They need to have been committed by a member or former member of the institution, so an outsider disqualifies the event. And the targets have to be either random or begin with some kind of focus and then radiate out in an untargeted and random way. Of course, this excludes many things that this audience might be very properly worried about and interested in, including things like drive-by shootings. But I want to make it clear that my remarks only pertain to instances that meet these definitional criteria. We have evidence of these kinds of shootings for about 30 years. But as this graph shows you, they were very, very few in number until the 1990s. And then we begin to see a spike in the 90s that reached its height in 1998 with the horrible episode in Columbine High School. For reasons that I will go into later, the Columbine episode precipitated a drastic fall in those numbers. But as you can see from that red line, which is the plot of near-miss plots, that is, shootings that we have good reason to believe were on the way because law enforcement intercepted the weapons and had good evidence that something horrible was about to happen, not only did not decline, but they actually increased after Columbine, but the completed shootings fell, and I will try and explain why I think that's the case. Initially, journalists and pop psychologists pointed to a southern culture of violence as an explanation for the rampage shootings eruptions. That's because the first cases did appear in the South. And in the book that emerged from this project, we go systematically through various causal theories and show that they don't quite account for any of the patterns. And in particular, they don't account for the geographic patterns because what emerged in the South spread very quickly. There is very little evidence for regional clustering of rampage school shootings, which is not to say that geography is unimportant. Rural and suburban communities account for about 95% of the cases that you see on this map. These kinds of incidents virtually never occur in large urban areas. And of course, those of you who know about the patterning of violence will recognize that this is bizarre because we think of the big cities as magnets for violence, but it turns out that they're not for this kind of violence. Because I want you to know how, what my conclusions are based on, I'm going to walk you briefly through the two case studies that formed the centerpiece of my research in Westside, Arkansas, and Heath, Kentucky. And there are three questions that I hope to address in the rest of my presentation. First, what motivates the shooter? Second, why were the schools unable to see the catastrophe coming in the face of what I will try and argue was a fair amount of evidence that something terrible was going to occur? 
And then thirdly, why was the community in the dark, similarly in the dark? But let me first tell you a little bit about the places where this field work took place. The first shooting that we studied occurred in a rural school district about 20 miles outside of the small town of Jonesboro, Arkansas. Jonesboro itself is a tiny town of about 55,000 people, but the shooting took place, oh, I should explain, it's in the middle of a very conservative, traditional Bible Belt part of the country. There are 75 churches within the boundary of this town of 55,000 people. People commonly attend church on Wednesday nights, on Saturdays and Sundays. The churches organize social activities that encompass most of the residents. We are not talking about a place in which people are anonymous, unknown to each other, or disconnected. We are talking about the opposite kind of place, where people are very well integrated, very well connected to one another, and the churches play an important role in that uh, social capital. But Jonesboro is a major megalopolis compared to where the shooting happened. It happened in a school district that encompasses three very tiny communities, as I said, 20 miles away. Um, one of them is Cache, Arkansas. This is downtown Cache, the second largest community in Westside, population 280 people. And you can get a pretty decent pulled pork sandwich in the Cache Cafe, but it's a long way from La Yers, those of you who know uh, Princeton's restaurants. So it's a very, very small town indeed. And the other towns were about the same size. One was even uh, smaller than this. The second case took place 20 miles outside of Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, Paducah is a, the, the Heath area of Kentucky is a rural area west of Paducah. It's a farming economy that is given away to a sort of services economy. It is composed largely of rural working class old timers. Again, a very stable community in which people have lived for many generations. Very few newcomers or outsiders. Um, there are new professionals and managers moving in from Paducah, but they are not new to the general area for the most part. So once again, this is a very small, very tight-knit community. It's economically diverse, but racially homogeneous, also in the middle of the Bible Belt. So just to give you a feeling for it, this is what rural Heath looks like. Um, it's, you know, it's really the middle of what was entirely farming territory which helps to account for why the older folks in the community remember having guns around a lot because they used to go out shooting after school. That was just the local entertainment to go out hunting after school. Um, and they would argue, if anything, guns have become less prevalent in the community today as this kind of land has been disappearing into uh, suburbs. The shootings themselves, the first one, as I said, uh, well, took place in Westside Middle School, which is a sixth and seventh grade middle school with 250 students. So again, we're not talking about a large anonymous institution, we're talking about a small middle school. It's middle class, it's Christian, it's white, there is no background violence, there was no background violence, still isn't in this school. It has an excellent reputation. People move from the city, so-called, into this area in order to put their kids in this school. One third of the kids qualify for free lunch, which tells you that there is some economic diversity, but there isn't much racial diversity at all. On the 24th of March, 1998, Mitchell Johnson stole the family car. He and his friend Andrew Golden uh, attempted to break into a safe containing the guns that belonged to the Golden family, and they failed even using a blowtorch. They failed to get into the safe. So they drove over to Andrew Golden's grandfather's house where they found a huge array of guns that were secured, um, but nonetheless by cables that could be clipped, which they did. They took these long-range rifles, they got into a car and drove it over, the first time anyone in this little twosome had ever driven anything, so they drove rather wobbly over to the school. Hid on the hillside, Andrew went into the school and pulled the fire alarm, which sent the school kids and teachers cascading out onto the playground in front of the hillside and they opened fire in an enfilade fashion. They killed four kids and one teacher and wounded 10 others very severely. The police arrested Andrew and Mitchell within about 10 minutes after the shooting, but I'm afraid by then it was all over. The second shooting took place in Heath High School, again, the center of small town life, a good school, not a troubled school. 60% of the students are college bound. No major discipline issues. What people worry about in these areas in terms of discipline is whether or not the school bus is going to arrive on time because school buses take hours and hours circulating through the countryside, picking up students who live long distances away from the school itself. And it turns out that in that unsupervised time, 
there's time to make mischief and make plots, and that's where the plot for this shooting uh, was hatched. But the, because there is no background violence, there was also no violence prevention in place. The shooting itself took place December 1st, 1997. The shooter, Michael Carneal, was 14 years old at the time. He'd only been in the school for about three months. It was Thanksgiving, right after Thanksgiving, so that's how long he'd been in his freshman year. He entered the school lobby. He took out a, a, a shotgun and unloaded it into a prayer group that met every morning in the school lobby. He got off eight shots. He found eight victims. Three of them died. A number of others were severely injured. He dropped the gun and surrendered to the school principal. What do we know about these shooters? Mitchell Johnson was, as I said, um, 13 years old at the time of the Jonesboro shooting. He came from a very troubled family, it's true. His father was verbally abusive. He was sexually assaulted as a young boy. And then the, the uh, assaulter took on uh, his younger brother as well. He was the product of a very tense divorce, which precipitated a series of moves in his family. But, and here is a kind of irony of all of this, is often true of suicide cases as well, the move to Jonesboro was the most positive in his life. He was doing better in Jonesboro than he had ever done in his whole life. His mother remarried. It was a happy marriage. It still is. The family was settled. He was doing well in school. He was known as a very good student. In fact, he was known as a model child. Um, he was the kid who the teachers would describe as the one who would hold the door open for the lady teachers, good morning, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Um, and that's the way the teachers saw him, which is why he was the last person in the world they would have thought of as a potential shooter. But his friends or his acquaintances were not surprised at all because for them he was a swaggering bully with a hair-trigger temper, um, known to rather violent rages, not, not so much physically violent, but verbally violent rages, and they were sort of afraid of him. Andrew Golden, his compatriot in all of this, 11 years old, in the sixth grade at the time, came from a very solid family known to everyone in the community, many generations deep in this community. He was the only child of these parents who had waited a very long time uh, to have him and therefore called himself, they called him the golden child. His family are avid hunters and gun enthusiasts. They, are, they run the Practical Pistol Association in the community, and they taught him to shoot at a very young age. This is a picture of him holding um, the gun that he used to shoot at the age of six when he began first earning his badges for, for gun safety. No real disciplinary history at all, but he was a kind of blank slate, just unnoticed in the school. Nobody could remember him. Even after the shooting, when we went back to interview the teachers, they just had no memories of him. Uh, they realized he'd been in the school, but they couldn't think of anything about him that was distinctive. But he was certainly known in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood, he was known as a menace, and that's because he was frequently seen riding around on his bike with a knife strapped to his leg. His, uh, the kids who knew him realized that he was torturing cats in the backyard. And so there are lots of reasons why they were very uneasy around Andrew, to the point where one of the psychiatric nurses that I interviewed, whose daughter died in the shooting, um, told her daughter that she would drive her to school rather than let her suffer through a bus ride with Andrew Golden. And I'm going to try and explain to you why it is that none of that kind of troubling information surfaced in the hands that could have done something to intervene in the life of a very troubled young boy. Michael Carneal, age 14, freshman in the school, as I mentioned. Again, very stable family. Father was a lawyer. Mother was a very well-educated homeowner, homemaker. Uh, he had the reputation for being a kind of incompetent jokester, prankster. Very high IQ, very smart, um, as is true of many of these kids. Very minor discipline problems. After the fact, after he was arrested, diagnosed as a schizotypal personality disorder and today is on very heavy antipsychotic medication and will be uh, certainly the rest of his life. This is a picture of Michael with his attorney at his arraignment, and you can see a very depressed young man indeed. Let me turn now to the three issues I told you I wanted to cover, starting with what motivates the shooter. And I'm going to try and argue that there are a series of issues we should bear in mind for high school shooters, and I'm going to tell you later that I don't think they hold very well for college shooters. But for high school shooters, failing at manhood, being on the margins, and experiencing a lot of friction being on the margins, 
the inability to process the slights and arrows of ordinary teenage life and turning them into something truly gigantic and horrible and oppressive, and finally, a set of problem-solving behaviors that end up with a tragic solution to the problems. So let me start first with the motivation of the shooter. There will never be a way, in my opinion, to identify and predict in advance who will become a school shooter. We've learned this from the Secret Service, which is in the business of predicting rare events, and they have concluded as much as well. But what my research can do is tell us something about why kids who become shooters do what they do. And the answer has to begin with the diagnosis of how these teenagers see themselves in their peer society. The school shooters we know about are always boys, and the word always is not a word we use in sociology hardly ever, because there's very few categories of social problems where you can say something is always this or always that, but we actually have no evidence whatsoever of a single rampage shooting of the kind I'm describing conducted by a girl. So they're always boys, and they're often quite smart, and they lean toward the nerdy side of life. They are very rarely good at sports. Jeffrey Wise, the shooter in Red Lake, enjoyed reading the classics, and he wrote about them on his website. And I can say as a college instructor that he was a fine writer. If we'd had him in our classrooms here in Princeton, we would have thought he was on par with the rest of our students in terms of his writing quality. He was also a very good observer of the social scene around him. Unfortunately, these are not qualities that get you much street cred in uh, peer society uh, for adolescent boys. Boys are not supposed to be reading Camus, and they're not supposed to be writing social criticism. And one imagines the Unabomber, who came to be known for his own trenchant critiques of modern society, was similarly marginal when he was a teenager. In the two communities that I studied, it is a serious social liability to be an intellectual boy. Jocks and cheerleaders really do rule the roost in these communities, and of course that's true in many American schools. So what makes these places special? Well, in a very small rural town where there is really nothing much to do um, and, the sp and there's really no way to get out of them, especially if you don't drive yet to someplace more cosmopolitan, the sports teams tend to be the focus of attention, not just in the school, but in the whole community. Adults turn up in droves at the high school whenever there is a football game. Parents travel every weekend with the marching band. The pep rallies are the biggest gatherings for miles and they don't just involve school kids. Now, there are many virtues to this kind of local manly culture. It provides a social glue that attaches the older generations to the younger, and we all think that that's, that's a very good thing. It gives everybody something to rejoice about when the team succeeds. But those of you who've either inhabited such places or have seen the remarkable film Friday Night Lights, which chronicles a year in the life of the Odessa High School football team, you know that where sports rules, there's often room for very little else. The whole local culture revolves around it. And if you live 250 miles from the nearest city, tucked way up north by the Canadian border, and you like reading Camus, you are going to find it very difficult to fit in to this local culture. And you can't get on a subway and go down to Greenwich Village to find people who might be more like you. So when a boy flunks the social tests of manhood, because he's not good at sports, because he's not interested in things other boys are interested in, he not only flunks that test in school, he flunks it in the rest of his community as well. Michael Carneal's case was more extreme than this. He was labeled gay in print in the school newspaper when he was in eighth grade. And no one could live down that kind of character assassination, not in a small southern town where there's probably no more damaging label for a boy. And because school shooters like Michael often suffer from the earliest onset of mental illness or depression, even though they are virtually never diagnosed at the time, the power of the teasing and bullying that he encountered and that others encounter uh, in his place is magnified in their minds. So he never lived this insult down, and it grated on him, and it entered his mind, and he ruminated over it, and it became a terrible kind of cause celebre in his mind. The friends and acquaintances of people like Michael Carneal report that this kind of torment is not that unusual. They go through their own uh, unhappy experiences of being teased and raised. But this isn't the way it feels on the inside to a school shooter, especially someone whose interpretive equipment is very faulty. So the first problem is they're failing at manhood. It's very public, and it's ratified by the whole community, not just their school friends. Second, frictional marginality. Oddly enough, if school shooters really were loners 
in high school, as the newspapers often report, they would probably have an easier time of it. But they're not loners. They do seek inclusion, repeatedly and ineffectively. And so they are persistently rebuffed. So they experience this kind of friction at the margins of social groups. They're trying to get into these groups, and they fail all the time. And what they experience then is rejection every day. And even when they succeed, they feel like they slide back to square one every day and have to regain, re-earn that entry into social groups. And to be fair, you know, I mean, it's a sad thing to say, but those social groups themselves achieve a degree of solidarity and happiness by rejecting people. They, they sort of monitor the boundaries of their, or edges of their groups by pushing other people away. So there is a kind of positive incentive, if you will, for teenagers to be really horrible to one another. So Michael Carneal sought every opportunity to worm his way into social groups. He tied the band crowd. They weren't buying. He dallied the, re the religious kids, but he concluded they were hypocrites when they weren't willing to tolerate him. Finally, he turned to the one crowd that rejected that status order, the Goths. This is the leader of the Goth group in Heath High School. This is the darkly charismatic young man that Michael Carneal would have given his right arm to impress. But Michael was largely unsuccessful with this guy and this crowd. But he didn't, well, that was not for lack of trying. He started down a long pathway of trying harder. He stole CDs and passed them along as shoplifting booty. He stole a gun from his father and he gave it to the Goths. But they didn't like that gun. They told him they were looking for shotguns they could whip out from underneath a trench coat and look really cool. Nothing worked to get the attention of, these, of this last chance social group until Michael started talking about shooting people. He and a group of five or six other boys in this gang started having conversations that the other goths regarded as fanciful. They started talking about taking over a shopping mall, and then they migrated to taking over a school. These conversations progressed from fantasy to a plan in Michael's mind, and it's not entirely clear what they represented to the goths. As is true in many of these cases, uh, charges were brought, conspiracy charges were brought and then dropped for lack of evidence and that is frequently the case because other people know what's going on and are often implicated in some form or other in school shootings. But none of these conversations ever cemented in Michael Carneal's mind the feeling that he could depend on the friendship of these folks. He was still on the margins. What I want to argue to you is that he had a problem but he wasn't running from it. He was trying to solve it. The problem was his reputation, and the solution, he thought, was to do something so dramatic that it would transform him from being the loser they thought he was to the notorious, dark, dangerous character that he thought they would be more attracted to. As he put it in his psychiatric interview after the shooting, and here I'm quoting, when he was asked, what did you think would happen after the shooting, he said, Everyone would be calling me, and they would come over to my house, or I would go over to their house. I would be popular. People who go to jail in our school have lots of friends, and all the kids say, wow. The decision he made to execute the shooting was, in the last analysis, the final act in a long series of dramas designed to move him from the periphery of this group to the center. There were other motivations in play, too. Some school shooters are looking for an exit from an intolerable existence at the hands of bullies but none of them are just trying to commit suicide. If they were just trying to commit suicide, they'd go out and put themselves in front of a bus. Why are they trying to take other people with them? Because they're trying to reverse their reputations in order to banish that negative status, and they do that by replacing that old image with something new and notorious. But in order to do that, they have to attract attention. It doesn't work to do that spontaneously, to just explode one day, so instead, they start to try and gain people's attention long before the actual act. When Michael Carneal fantasized with the leader of this goth group about shooting up a mall and then shooting up the high school, he'd started to generate some interest. But the only way to sustain that attraction was to make promises, to make dark hints. And once those promises leaked out from his mouth, he couldn't back down. Shooters tend to lend off these idle threats and then find they have to make good on them. To back down after having claimed you're going to do something dramatic is to lose face. Now let's look at why the schools are in the dark. There are four topics I want to go to here, and I'll try and be brief because I want to be sure you have some time for questions and move on to the rest of your program. 
Sociologists have studied the workings of complex organizations throughout the history of my discipline. We're interested in how bureaucracies function, especially in how information moves around bureaucracies, or more to the point, how it gets stuck in bureaucracies. And you can see that preoccupation at play, for example, in the revelations about the difficulties that FBI field officers had getting anybody in headquarters to pay attention to their suspicions about Zachariah Musawi, whose computer they were trying to get to, but they couldn't get anybody to uh, pay attention to what they were saying. In all complex bureaucracies, there are filters at work that screen out information. Michael Carneal had been enrolled in Heath High School for less than three months when the shooting happened. What did his teachers and administrators know about his history? The answer is not much. Most of the disciplinary background that we uncovered after the fact developed when he was in middle school. But nobody in the high school had any idea about these incidents. They never heard that he'd been called gay in print. They didn't realize that his high B average plummeted to a D plus in the eighth grade. They didn't know he was grabbing fish out of the tank in the biology classroom and stomping it into the floor. The middle school disciplinary records that might have told them this kid had some problems were shredded when the kids graduate, and that is quite typical, by the way. A combination of secrecy rules and privacy rules and the desire not to implicate a kid in a way that will necessarily predispose people to have a bad view of him, just to assume ninth grade is going to be terrible because eighth grade was terrible, tends to lead school districts to shred disciplinary records, especially when kids are moving across institutional boundaries. As a society, we all subscribe to the value of a clean slate, the idea that everyone should be able to start over. So the trail of misbehavior that might have been interpreted as a signal that at least this kid needed some help went cold. This is what we mean by structural secrecy. It is built into the organizational system of the schools that information is not transferring across those boundaries. And it's pronounced in lots of schools. Pedagogical theory tells teachers they shouldn't prejudice each other against a kid who's had a bad year. And so they, don't, they, they are professionally enjoined from gossiping about their students. They may do so from time to time, but this is not a routine practice. The school principal and the librarian knew that Michael Carneal had been looking at pornography on the library computers, which in the Bible Belt is really a no-no. But they didn't know that he had written disturbing, murderous essays in his English class, which I repeat in the book so you could judge for yourself what you would do if you received essays like this, including the real names of the students in the school. The teacher who knew that Carneal's handwriting was starting to run together into an unintelligible schizophrenic salad a couple of weeks before the shooting never mentioned it to a principal or a counselor. The teachers who knew that Mitchell Johnson angel that he was, yes ma'am, no sir, that he was, had sworn a blue streak in class, didn't know that he wrote a threatening essay in detention. Information is partialed out, it's rarely collected in one place, it's divided by institutional boundaries. And this is what we mean by structural secrecy. The mixed signals problem makes the pattern even more difficult to detect. Like all kids, school shooters are adept at the art of segregating their personalities and behavior in front of different audiences. My kids do not behave the same way in front of their teachers as they do in front of their friends, as they do in front of me, and kids are adept at that kind of code switching. But code switching of this kind makes it very difficult to see a pattern in a kid's behavior. If Mitchell Johnson was regarded as a choir boy, teachers are not looking at him as somebody who could become dangerous. About two months before the shooting, one of Mitchell's teachers sent a letter, actually it was a card, to his mother, which she showed me after the fact, it was sent completely unprompted, and it said, Dear Mrs. Johnson, you must be so proud of Mitchell. He's just the most wonderful, polite boy. You know, my congratulations on raising such a fine son, two months before the shooting. All three of the shooters we studied were able to conceal their discrediting behavior, especially from adults. They didn't conceal it from other kids. Other kids were very aware that they were angry and belligerent and potentially troublemaking, but they were able to segregate those audiences. But this mixed signals problem, or a Jekyll and Hyde type personality, makes it very difficult when coupled with information fragmentation to catch somebody in advance. I'm going to speed up through this stuff, because uh, you probably aren't here for a sociology lesson, but I actually do think it, it helps us understand why these things happen, to, to delve a little bit into these ideas. So you're all familiar with, a, with an assembly line in a factory where every widget has, has to be put together one by one and, and any widget that falls off the table sort of messes up the whole car. That's what we call a tightly coupled system. 
Schools are quintessentially the opposite of loosely coupled. They are loosely coupled systems. What happens in my classroom or in a high school classroom has no effect on what happens in any other classroom. Hence, we are granted a lot of autonomy as professionals to rule in our classrooms. There may be some regulations that dictate when we're supposed to report some egregious behavior, but anything that falls below that level is probably going to stay in my internal bailiwick. The problem with tightly coupled systems is the widget falling off the floor and a problem ramifying through the system immediately. That's what the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster, for example, was all about. The problem with a loosely coupled system is a problem can fester in any one of its parts, and if it doesn't derail the whole institution, it doesn't come to anybody's attention. Nothing that Michael Carneal or Andrew Golden did ever brought their schools to a grinding halt until the day they murdered their classmates. In a loosely coupled system, only the really squeaky wheels get disciplinary attention, and then we bring the hammer down on it. If it really threatens the ability of the institution to function, we do have ways. We have uh, detention schools, we have continuation schools, we remove people from that population. But these are not the kinds of kids we remove because they're not the kids with a disciplinary history. And teachers routinely told us they could name 50 other kids they might have imagined shooting somebody before they got to the two who did, because they had no such history. So when routine disasters stem from the breakdown of informational transfer, loosely coupled systems are more problematic than tightly coupled ones. They promote festering and organizational blindness. Now let me look at the last and perhaps most uh, frustrating aspect of this story, why the kids don't tell. The most important reason why the schools were unaware of what was coming at them was that the best sources of information clammed up completely. In the book on which this lecture is based, my research team compiled a long list of peers who heard all three of these shooters issue warnings that ranged from veiled threats to taunts. Andrew Golden got up on the table top in the lunchroom only a few days before the tragedy at Westside and proclaimed that he was going to shoot up the school. Mitchell Johnson told several kids that they wouldn't see him for a while because he would be running from the cops. The shooter in Bethel, Alaska, who took out the school principal, a 16-year-old star athlete and some others, called 20 people the night before the shooting and told them exactly where to assemble to watch him do something terrible. They showed up almost to a person, one of them with a video camera, but nobody told a single adult what they knew. Some of the warnings that Michael Carneal gave were specific enough to cause kids to stay away from the school or from the Heap lobby on that fateful day. Many kids in Westside knew who the shooters were before the police captured them. There was no surprise among their peers. They knew because the shooters had told them, and the shooters tell them because their mission is to attract attention more than it is to actually kill people. Why don't kids come forward? With something so horrible, why don't they come forward? There are a variety of reasons. First, they are really afraid of losing friends. And they are really afraid of being perceived as a turncoat or a rat, especially at this age. Early adolescence in particular, when they're trying to establish themselves as separated from the adult world, to be labeled a mama's boy, a teacher's pet, or a rat is highly discrediting. But if the threat is serious enough, they do come forward. How would they know if it was serious? Well, here lies the rub. The case studies that we studied occurred early on in this little mini epidemic we're living through. The whole concept of a rampage shooting on school grounds was new and still largely unthinkable. So when the kids heard these warnings, it meant something very different than it meant after Columbine. Given the time frame, the frame of reference at that time, it was not easy for kids to understand what it meant when Michael Mitchell said he would be running from the police. It was like, what is he talking about? With the right framing that a school shooting is possible, then kids will know that it's serious enough to report it. Without that framing, the signals are weak and ambiguous. And with this very high social cost, it's not enough for them to cross that DMZ to the adult world. And when the speaker is known as all three of these boys were as the kind of kid who always says outlandish things, who's always trying to attract attention, then these kinds of comments become one more dumb thing Mitchell Johnson said. When the signals are this mixed and the stakes of coming forward are this high, the cautious teenager hangs back and keeps it to himself. And the reticence is encouraged, unfortunately, by what we learned about how teenagers think about bureaucracies like the ones we adults operate. They provided us with example after example of adults 
who, when presented with trouble, told the kids in so many words, you know, you really have to learn to handle your own problems. Or don't bother me, I'm busy, which was more or less exactly what the teacher said in Cleveland, or the principal said in Cleveland not long ago when a horrible rampage shooting happened there. Or I'm sure it's not all that serious. These kinds of messages, when the kids hear them, tend to make them push away from coming forward. Alternatively, those who take a complaint seriously when brought forward by a kid often fail to keep the source private. Kids who were privy to warnings about school shootings held back because they thought they'd be identified as the source, and under those circumstances, they kept to themselves. Final mystery, why the community didn't see it coming. I've described these places as places where everybody knows your name, where it's tight-knit, the churches are active, the adults and the kids are glued together. There's none of this kind of urban anomie that we hear about so much. Why is it then that this kind of trouble wasn't visible to them? Adults in routine contact with Michael Carneal heard him make statements repeatedly about how he would solve problems with extreme violence. His Sunday school teacher, with whom he took confirmation classes the whole year before the shooting, remembered how she would present hypothetical dilemmas to her Sunday school class and ask them how would the teachings of their church influence them in solving a dilemma, and Michael's answer was usually that he would get a bazooka and blow people to kingdom come. Adults and teenagers witnessed him reacting in frustration by throwing a bike into a bonfire. Andrew Golden, as I said, was riding around the neighborhood with a knife sheathed to his leg and he was torturing cats in the backyard. Why didn't anybody tell the parents? Well, first, the master narrative in both communities is that this is the greatest place in the world to raise your kids. That's why we move here. So if your master narrative is this is a perfect place to raise your kids, you don't believe these, and you don't pay attention to these little wiggling signals that something might not add up to that narrative. Secondly, and this I found really quite fascinating, when we brought parents together in focus groups and we said to them, would you tell your neighbor if you saw his child or her child doing something dangerous? Would you actually follow through on the reputation your community has of being a place where every adult is looking out for all of the community's kids? At first they said, absolutely, that's why we moved here. That's why we live here. But after a while, they started to back away from that and said, you know, I would really examine the motives of somebody who came forward with bad news about my child. I would want to know if they were jealous I would want to know what motivated them to say these nasty things about my kid. And if you live in a community in which all your friends, everybody you've known your whole life, lives next door to you, and they're not going anywhere, and you're not going anywhere, because these are very, very stable communities where people don't even go away to college, they stay put. And the cheerleader of the school marries the used car salesman and they stay there forever and ever. You don't rupture your own adult friendship bonds very easily either. So you just hold back. You just tell your kid, I'll drive you to school so you don't have to be on the bus with that boy. The residential stability of these small towns means that those bonds are permanent and very, very difficult to rupture. The consequences for adults are terrible. The high degree of intergenerational closure means that adults are very aware to some degree of what kids are doing, and so the kids drive their deviance deep underground. High levels of social capital, meaning that there's a tremendous amount of trust and inter interlocking networks among people means that there's no way to break out of that network to report trouble without suffering tremendous consequences. You worry about your gossip and reputation, and so everything flies below the radar screen. So terrible things happen in perfect places because instead of coming forward with information, people play concealment games. They have false confidence in the surveillance that they're exercising over the other kids in the community. They believe that anything that could go wrong will be identified in advance. They misinterpret the signals that they're hearing because if your kid, if this troubled kid comes from a house of the, the lawyer with a fine reputation, you just don't think that that's going to be real trouble in the long run. And in general, you avoid conflict rather than court it, and you restrict information in order to avoid conflict. Otherwise, you run the risk of blaming the messenger. Now, um, I'm going to conclude with a few comments about the presentation I've just given and then spend about three seconds on what I've learned about um, whoops, college rampage shootings and how I think they differ. And this is very preliminary because I'm working on a paper about this for this summer, but I thought since this audience is mainly composed of safety officers from universities and colleges, I should tell you what little I do know. 
But here's the, here's the pitch I want to make. I think a sociological perspective on school shootings really matters because it directs our attention away from the definition of a shooter as a deranged, spontaneous deviant, and instead helps us look at them as an adolescent who is solving problems. An adolescent with very faulty equipment, to be sure. An adolescent who's likely to become somebody who's extremely troubled if they live long enough um, and get old enough to become those college shooters I'm going to talk about in a moment. So it identifies these forms of organizational deviance that block the transfer of information, and I think we need to look very hard at the institutions we are part of and how information flows or doesn't in our own institutions. And finally, the liabilities of tightly knit communities, which we tend to think of as entirely virtuous. And they are, for many reasons, they are quite virtuous. But they can block information, they can make the cost of coming forward very high, and so there is a kind of dark side to that social capital. What I presented to you here is a set of necessary but not sufficient conditions. We cannot predict where a school shooting will happen, so the best that we can do, in my judgment, is to tip the odds in favor of interdiction. In particular in high schools, we want to make it as easy as possible for those kids to come forward when they have information because they are the ones who are going to hear it and we are not. And if they can, if they can glean the idea that the information will be treated seriously, confidentially, but acted on, and sadly, if they are reminded that these things actually do happen, if they don't lose that frame that tells them the warnings they're hearing could signal something real, uh, then we may do better at interdiction. And it is, that last point is important. Those of us, you know, all of the grown-ups in this room have long memories, and Columbine was yesterday. But if you're 12 or 13, Columbine was 1,000 years ago, and you don't know much about it. And so unless we keep that frame in front of kids' eyes so that they know how to interpret what they're hearing and therefore cause a red line like the one I showed you of, decline, of rising near misses but plummeting actual shootings because people are coming forward, those near misses are being caught, and they're being caught because kids are coming forward, and they're coming forward because they know something truly awful could happen. Let me say just a brief word about the college school shootings. There have been, as far as I can tell, five shootings from 2002, which is roughly when we stopped collecting the data for this book, to uh, just recently, to, to February of 2008. Five rampage shootings that meet the definitions that I've been using. There have been many other incidents that you might be worried about, but there are five that, that have this random quality to them. What can I tell you about them? Well, they violate some of the uh, conclusions that I've drawn here in the high school cases in ways that we need to think more about. Of course, with five cases, we're talking about such a small database that we have to understand that this is really almost at the level of speculation, but I think it's important nonetheless. First, the first female case, the first one in our entire archive, uh, came up in February of this year. This was at Louisiana Technical College in Baton Rouge where a young woman uh, came into a nursing classroom and, and blew away uh, a number of people. Um, three people died, including the shooter. The first woman, all the rest are males. Among the males, and there are four of them, um, three of them are immigrants. And we don't see much evidence of immigrants in the high school shooting cases. And I don't know how significant this is. One of them was born in Nigeria, one in India, one in South Korea. You're all familiar with the Virginia Tech case. And I think we probably need to understand uh, how marginality can er arise in the lives of immigrants, especially second generation immigrants, who may, uh, whose, whose adult, the adults in their families may well be incorporated into the labor force and they may be accepted in the adult world, but for kids this can be a bit of an uphill struggle to become socially accepted. Another point I would make about the college shootings is that, of course, by definition, these people are older. They're a lot older. Um, the youngest in this sample is 23. The oldest was 62. Um, and so we're not talking about young teenagers anymore. And that's, I think, quite material here. Because with the young teenagers, this question of social acceptance and fitting into a social group is extremely important. And they're at the very beginnings of mental illness which, if they live long enough, often does become absolutely full-blown. But it's difficult to recognize a schizophrenic at the age of 13. Those symptoms, we're not very adept at that. We are much better at, uh, able to recognize it in the mid-20s, which is where the diagnostic categories tend to stick. 
these people are getting much closer to that more canonical state of extreme mental illness. And there's a lot of evidence from what I've been able to glean from uh, you know, a media study, basically, that uh, the vast majority of them had extreme symptoms of mental disorders, deep depression, suicidal ideation. Um, so there's a lot more to be learned here. I'm sure you have more to say than I do about prevention. I think it's actually much more difficult in the college setting. There are some things that are easier. I think the peer acceptance situation is actually somewhat easier than in high school, but the, the possibility of becoming a loner and detached is, is easier or more prevalent in a college setting in which those tight bound cliques, damaging as they may be, are not as evident and navigating the social shoals in a college setting, especially if you are really mentally disordered, can be highly problematic. There's a lot more for me to learn about this and I'm sure for you as well. But it's all worth it because we don't want to see more people like this. Michael Carneal at the age of 19, he will be in the Kentucky uh, Reformatory until he's 45 years old. Um, if Michael Carneal had looked like this, six feet tall, 200 pounds, when he was 13, I'm not sure any of this would ever have happened because he would have looked more like the canonical male he really wanted to be. But when he was that little dweeby guy with the glasses on, a skinny, skinny little guy who couldn't fit into adolescent life, um, he couldn't call on the advantages of this stature. And I think that's not an accident. Young boys are in varying states of development. Some of them look like the men they're going to become and some of them look like little boys and that makes it a very dangerous period indeed. And we certainly don't want to see more people like this. The victims in the West Side case, the four children and the teacher who died trying to protect one of them. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.